how many of you remember the fact that I've been saying for quite a while, I've been trying to get up and, and God gave me a message. And every time I would get up for like the last month, he would change it on me. So last, yesterday when I, when I got back and was getting ready to prepare, he said, uh, go over those notes. So we're going to deliver it tomorrow. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> he said, yes. I, I'm, I like prepared. But um, it's something we don't talk about a lot. And I'm only going to deal with one aspect of it right now, but I believe this is something God wants us to, to become more aware of as we enter into this season. You know, there's a, there's a word that says, where sin abounds, grace does abound the more, right? Yes. Sin comes to us partly because of our own desires, but also because of the assistance and influence of demonic spirits. And how many of you realize that there are demonic spirits around you at all times? Did you know that? There are always demonic spirits around you. Now the word, all, the word tells us that your angels are also there. And since, and since there are at least twice as many angels as there are devils, uh, you're, you're always ahead of it. But since it only takes one regular angel to throw Satan into the pit... At the end of things, uh, you're not going to have to worry too much about how many demons may be around you, uh, provided you where you belong at the time, and not walking in rebellion. And then you're going to just need to really make sure you call out on those angels. But we all deal with demonic spirits every day. Every day. They're always around us. They're buffeting us. They're speaking in our ears. They're making us offers that they think we can't refuse. Uh, they're bringing our favorite people who always have their favorite thing to say to irritate you beyond belief. Uh, oftentimes, they're the one who helps the car cut you off and grab your parking space. Uh, any number of things. They're always ever around. They're doing their job just like God's angels are. Well, the problem that we deal with is because part of our walk is our responsibility to allow the Holy Spirit to change our flesh. And bring us into the image and the character of Christ. Amen? And that's not always that easy. You have, to, you have to allow that to happen. So about five weeks ago, the Lord said, I want you to speak on the spirit of competition. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, I, I, when I think of competition, I think of basketball games, football games, track events, boxing, uh, competition for a better job, that kind of stuff. And so as I was studying it, what I, real, what I found out was competition is a spirit, can be a spirit. So we're going to look at the characteristics of a spirit of competition. This spirit does have certain characteristics. One of the things is when it starts to work in us, it starts out with any poor attitudes we may have. It, the devil's smart. He always works on our weaknesses rather than trying to create a weakness. You know, why change something that's working is one of the old expressions I hear in work and in anything we do. Well, the devil's been doing this for a very long time, so he looks for our weaknesses. Now, just because we're born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, how many of you realize you still have weaknesses? Absolutely. Amen? Yes. And they always come upon you and overtake you at the one time you want to control them and not let them overtake you. Right. And you, then you're standing there afterwards going, I can't believe that. I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe this. I can't believe that. Well, the enemy's there. The Bible says the enemy lies at our doorstep waiting. Right. Amen? But when we walk out, if, if we're learning to walk in the character of Christ, when we walk out, that first foot that step out, steps outside our doorway is the foot of dominion. Reminding ourselves the devil's under our feet. But sometimes we forget. The first characteristic I found on the spirit of competition is found in James chapter 4 and verse 6. 
I'm, I'm reading this from the English Standard Version. But he gives us more grace. I kind of like the way he starts this, considering the rest. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as I'm looking this over, I said, okay, Lord, what does the word say proud is? And it's this, one, to consider yourself above others. Now, there's two ways to look at that. To consider yourself above others, or to consider yourself first and others second, third, or fourth. So, a spirit of competition is actually a disguised spirit whose roots are the true weapon that he uses against us. Pride. Another definition of pride uh, in, in the Greek, despising or treating others with contempt. Despising or treating others with contempt. I don't like the way they do this. I don't like the way they do that. Uh, uh, just something about their voice irritates me. I don't like the way they part their hair. You know, I don't like the way the, the I, I don't like the way they. Here's, this is a good one. I don't like the way they act prideful. <laughs> that's that's pride speaking. Another one is overestimating your own personal value or your financial worth. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, we all know what your financial worth is all about. And if you grew up in high school and junior high school, you understand how some, when you're young, when I was young, I don't know that it's changed that much, even though the manner of dress is different. The label on your jeans the label on your sneakers, the label on your sweater, or your, or your, or, or your, you know, your shirt, whatever it is, that spoke huge things about you. So, I mean, when Levi's were the thing, oh, God help you if you wore J.C. Penney. Amen. Uh, if your parents had the financial wherewithal to shop at the Mammoth Mart. How many of you remember the Mammoth Mart? The pre, it was the predecessor of most of the big box stores up here. Or W.T. Grants, or, you know, or Kmart, or you know, Targets, those places. When you went there, now, nowadays they're getting smart. They have creative logo people. But, you know, the people who are impressed with themselves and the way they dress and want people to know that they have privilege because of the fi in high school it's because of their family's financial worth they they know which ones are which and a lot of times they'll go out of their way say oh you may look like me but you're not see i have an alligator you got a duck <laughs> you know how many of you have experienced that or seen it the other thing is overestimating your pers personal value means it's kind of like the football star or the basketball star or the baseball star. Pfft, without me, there is no team. Without me, there is no team. And we all know, we all know that. All you've got to do is watch ESPN for a little while. You'll see many of them. Uh, but the problem is, is that goes right down to your jobs. And it doesn't really matter what level you are in if you work for a company. Let's say you work for Walmart. It doesn't matter what level you may be, you can always find somebody beneath you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, hey, I have this department, or I have this skill, or I've been doing this longer, or I had better training than you, or... Yeah. They're, just, they're, they're grooming me for management. They may not be, but that's the attitude. That's the attitude. Another, another definition of pride is despising or treating other people with contempt. 
saying, you don't have the value I have. So don't get too close. I don't want you to stain the material. The fourth definition is call, of pride is false superiority. Mm-hmm. You think you're better, but you're not. And in reality, the higher someone goes, the more prone they are to that one. And, and, but it matters not what level you're in. I mean, there are even homeless people who are proud of the fact that they've been homeless longer than others. No, I'm serious. Uh, There are homeless people who say, I may be homeless, but I know all the best places to sleep when it's cold. I may be homeless, but I know every right person to talk to where they give away free meals. You know, I may be homeless, but I've I've built this little cabin next to the railroad tracks and so forth. And, And they're proud of their success at being the lowest. Pride, it doesn't matter what level socially you're on, what level economically you're on, false superiority and pride is available to each and every person. That's one thing I can say. I don't want to say admiration, but I have to shake my head at at, at their ability is they are equal opportunity tempters. No matter how high or how low, they'll tempt you all equally. The second thing is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry, <clears throat> excuse me, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So, Anybody here ever met someone who was conceited? Okay, so everybody has at least a picture. The definition of, the Greek definition is someone lacking humility. Have you ever had somebody admit they were wrong, but as they were admitting they were wrong, by the time they were done, they were really saying they were right? That's right. I'm telling you. Or, their humility is what we call false humility. Oh, you know, when, when somebody says, well, you were wrong, and they go, oh, forgive me. Does that sound sincere to you? No, it isn't. Conceit is also wrapped up in pride. It's also wrapped up in pride. It also means not willing to count others with more significance than yourself. A conceited person will never, ever, in their pursuit of what they want, will never, ever back down from what they want so that others can have what they want if it interferes with what the conceited person wants. And if they help you, they're actually helping you to fail. That's right. All the time. And make it seem like they're doing you this big favor. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me talk to that. Pro- you know, you're trying to get this position. You're trying to get a promotion. Hey, listen, he and I are good friends. Let me talk to him for- on your behalf. And the next thing you know, you're the first one off the list for promotion and wondering why. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I was really, you know, talking you up. But unfortunately, they told me that... Uh, I was the one they were considering. I'm sorry, you know. But once I get up there, I'll I'll help you. That stuff happens all the time. The third thing is competitive people are envious of others. Galatians 5.26 Let us not become conceited, interesting, provoking one another. Don't be a troublemaker. Don't get them to a place where they explode so that you can say, see, I told you they were like that. I told you they were like that. And that comes from another aspect that I'll tell you in just a second. Lacking humility is what an envious person is. Envy 
I, I, and, and, and those people envy everybody in one, in one way or another. People who are above them, they wish they were above, but they'll treat them better than people who are on the same level. People that are beneath them, a lot of times, they don't pay much attention to because they already consider them under their feet like, the, like we would consider the devil. But people that are competing with them for the same thing. I've seen it on sports teams. I, I, I mean, it, it's the worst. Uh, you see it in a marriage. Husbands and wives ought not to be competing with, with one another. Brothers and sisters ought not to be competing against one another. Uh, we can see it if you, if you come from a larger family. I came from a pretty large family. My father had 11 brothers and sisters that lived uh, to, to adulthood. So that, then add, add another at least 13 or 14 wives. I had a couple hiccups in there. And I think, I think the smallest family in, in, uh, in my aunts and uncles were three children. That was the smallest. So when we got together immediately, it was a big family. And you could see it, the dynamics in a family reunion, the social climbing, you know, the positioning, uh, the lying stories. My vacation was better than your vacation. My retirement package is better than your retirement package. My position at work is better than your position at work. But they never tell you that way. They always tell you, in such a, oh, just having conversation. Let me bring you up on what's going on in my life and all the wonderfulness of it. And they always seem to touch on the things they consider are your shortcomings. But you can also take this over into relationships with just people in the world, acquaintances, co-workers, things of that nature. It makes us do crazy things. Another definition of envious is, or characteristic, I should say, is challenging or combative towards others because of jealousy. You know, there's a script. How many of you remember this scripture? Most of you probably do. I believe it's in James. You have not because you ask not. And when you ask and you don't receive it, it's because you're asking to consume it upon your own lust. Now that's not just talking about things. That's talking about changing situations and circumstances. You can, if you don't like a situation or a circumstance and you want it to be this, then if you're not careful, you can become challenging or combative because you are jealous for what they have that you don't have. Little children do this. Yes. Put four and five-year-olds together and two toys. <laughs> oh my God. It could be toys they all have at home and never play with. But you get a bunch of kids together and the natural inclination, yes, even our godly little Holy Ghost parented Christian kids, you'll go, there'll always be somebody who, that's my toy, and if that's what you were, and, and I've watched them, oh, this, he's, this, this, he's really enjoying that. So I want it. And they may take it and then not even play with it. They just keep it. I've seen kids sit cross-legged and stuff the toy under one of the legs. Well, can I play with that now? No, I'm playing with it. What do you mean you're playing with it? It's sitting there. I'm playing hide and go seek. Kids are smart. Kids aren't dumb. The problem is, is if you're not careful, you won't outgrow that. We, I talked to you about at Rama, how we had people believing for wives or girls believing for husbands. You know, you know the old joke, the, not Rama Bible Training Center, but Rama Bridal Training Center. <laughs> Kaylee knows what I'm talking about. We laughed about that. When, it didn't even take you your whole first year to figure that one out. And... Uh, they, they covet. They don't care if the other person's in a relationship. They don't care if the other person's married. 
God told me that's going to be my wife or that's my husband. Well, if, you know, what are they, what are they believing for? At the very least, a separation, and at the very worst, a death. Hello? Do you see how competition can degenerate into murder? Now, not necessarily physical murder, although I'm sure that happens. But by, Jesus said, if you kill somebody in your heart, you've killed them. That's right. Just the same way as if you lust after somebody in your heart, you've committed adultery. The, the, it's the intent of our heart. And uh, I think I was, was it uh, around the fireplace, I was talking about a, uh, a guy that my wife and I went to school with who we found out later on in school, you ha- if you were married, your wife had to be at school with you. Oh, this young man was at school, and, and the administration thought he was single. And it turns out he wasn't. He was married, and his wife was back in some other state. And because she wouldn't come, he said, well, I'm going. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take care of the bills, but I'm going. You can stay here. So he came to Ramah by himself, which is a major no-no. And no letter of permission from his wife, which they wouldn't have agreed with anyway. So they're sitting there, and, you, and, and he's checking out all the, all the young girls all the time. And my wife and this, and this young gal that sat with us, who was a member of Pastor Jonathan's church, we didn't even know Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan back then, uh, would sit next to this guy. He said he always gives us the creeps. And so one day they're sitting there, and one bumps the other. I don't know which, and they look over, and he's got this drawing on his pad that he's drawing, and it shows a, it shows a woman lying dead on the floor in, in, a, in, in a puddle of blood and a man standing over him with a, with a knife dripping in blood. My personal opinion, that was his heartfelt desire, maybe not for the, a murder to take place, but for his wife to go away. I mean... That, that's, almost, that, that's almost the beginning of a hallmark mystery. But that's what happened when you're envious of what other people have and you can't have it. Or you're afraid if it continues, they'll take something that's yours. A job, position, happens all, a lot in business. Your money any number of, th- anybody here ever hear the expression, somebody's a sponge? And we're not talking about they soak up water, are we? What do they soak up? Money, possessions, they, they hang by you because they're trying to suck off from you what they think, what, what, what you've got or they think you have. Um, it, and so there's this attitude of, when you are envious, you've become a sponge. And, 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 and in the worst sense of the word. Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to suck, suck life out of them for yourself. Sometimes we put a wall around ourselves in the life that we have, not simply to protect it, but to keep others from stealing it. And yet, Scripture tells us, give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For with the same measure you measure out to others is the same measure that God will measure to you. So, competition, by its nature, is selfish. It all revolves around self. And yet, Scripture tells us to be devoid of self. Paul, it's no longer I that live, but what? And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I died, he said. I died. Now, most Christians, the reality is, when you get born again, you died with Christ. You were nailed to the cross with Christ. You were buried with Christ so you can be resurrected with Christ. However, the soul and the body, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body, 
need to be trained and overcome by your born again spirit. That's right. Correct? That's right. So what we're supposed to be doing with our emotions, what we're supposed to be doing with our thoughts, what we're supposed to be doing with our with our physical senses and our strengths and what we're supposed to be doing with our finances is become a conduit and and a river of provision flowing out to others. So our whole thing is giving. You say, well, if, how many of you know that to be true? How many of you say that in, in my life I'm trying to do that? No, honestly, raise your hands. If you think, I'm trying to do that. I'm not asking you if you're perfect. If you're not, then what you're really saying is, I am afraid. That's also a part of competition. I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I am afraid that God will not provide for me. I can remember during the hippie people movement, we had, we had a lot of really cool poster sayings back in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, we'd have these posters with flowers, you know, and uh, if, if you really love the, I, I, I don't know exactly how all the little phrases went, but uh, if, if you love the flower, you won't pick it because you kill it. Which is, a, there's a truth to that, isn't it? Now, we, we consider people that way. Picking it is possessing it. But uh, one of the, during the charismatic renewal, one of the ones I like was a giant guitar and a dove. And it said, he who sings prays twice. Those kind of things. Amen. But there's one that I heard, and I've heard, it, I've, I've heard it in messages since. So the guy must have been an ex-hippie. What you compromise to keep you're guaranteed to lose. How many times have we heard or seen of people who struggle to keep their position in a job and do whatever it takes to have it only to see them out the door before their time? How many times have we seen athlete, athletes who are, who are, it has to be about them. I, I'm, I'm the glue that holds this team together so I have my demands. I'm not getting enough airtime with, you know, with the reporters after the games. I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting enough preference in, in who starts the game, uh, this and that. I'm not getting my due. And the next thing you know, they're traded. They're gone. And, and everywhere they go, they do the same thing. But the end result is nobody wants them after a while. Or they spent so much time telling everybody how good they are, they forgot, to, they forgot to learn how to give, and therefore they weren't good for the team anymore, and they became less than, even less than what they actually were, and much less than they thought they were. And that's what happens when a spirit of competition controls our life and our decision making. The bottom line is we are not trusting God to fulfill that void. Honestly, is there really anything that a human being can give you that will fill a void in your life no. fully. No. No. How many of you have tried besides me? I thought weightlifting was going to do it for me until I found out there were better weightlifters. And what really got me is when anabolic steroids hit the streets, now, I had come out of a drug culture, so I was no longer doing drugs. And, they, and I'd see these guys in, in eighth grade and ninth grade outlifting me. Now, I wasn't weak. I was benching hundreds of pounds. I was squatting hundreds of pounds. Deadlifting. I could deadlift just under 600 pounds. Which was, you know, that's, that, back then that was a big deal. We're talking 1970, 70, I mean, 71, 72, 73. And then the next thing you know on the scene, there was a kid I was at a competition. He weighed 171 and three quarters pounds because you couldn't weigh more than 172 to be in that class. He squatted 735 pounds. The world record, which was set by one of my, by one of my lifting buddies, 
It was set in India in 1972 for a super heavy. Meaning, you get to a certain point and everybody who weighs more than this, you're in that, you're in that thing. He squatted 1,005 pounds, but he weighed 300 pounds. And a kid 172 squatted over 700 pounds. 100 and some odd pounds lighter. Why? Because of drugs. And so you, you look at that and you say, wow, that's amazing. But the problem with all of those guys, pretty soon their elbows and knees started to go. They started getting growths on their bodies. Um, how many of you remember Lyle Alzado, the football player? Uh, he, he, was in the, he was playing professional football during the era of, of that type of, of drug use in professional football. And he became a Christian, God bless him, but he died having nine cancerous tumors in his brain. What you compromise to keep, you'll lose. Possess nothing but Christ. That's right. That's right. Possess nothing by Christ, and there is nothing that can't be yours. That's right. Amen? That's hard for us in our human form to just grab that and receive it. I'll be honest with you. It's hard. Because we, most of us have been raised, if you want it, go get it. Amen? If you're going to be successful, put your whole heart into it. And there's truth in that. But for a believer, that means taking all your gifts, all your abilities, all your hopes, all your dreams, all your fears, all your phobias, and throw them on the altar of Christ. Casting all your cares upon Him. And then trusting God to fill it based on what He knows we need and, and will bless us, not based on what we think we need or will bless us. And that's one of the toughest things for any of us as human beings. If you don't believe me, go out to buy another car. What we want and what we need. I remember Adam called me up year ago, I'm going, to sell, I'm going to trade my car in. Remember that one? And, uh, I mean, he's driving a nice car. Driving a better car than I drive. <laughs> I'm not coveting. <laughs> but I asked him, I said, well, how much do you owe on this car? And he told me. I said, so we, we kind of talked back and forth. And just to get him to the place where he would say, you know what? Owning a car paid for and then keeping that monthly payment in my, in my pocket, as long as the vehicle's in good shape, is a good thing. Well, what was it? when did you tell me? Was it Friday or Saturday? You made your last payment. Car is his. Next month, he doesn't have to worry about where's the money for the car coming. You should have seen him. Paid my car off. I mean, he was, somebody sat down and said, hey, how you doing? Paid my car off. It was, it's great. It's great. But if we allow, because he took godly wisdom, I, I got that from God, so I'm not claiming the wisdom. Uh, if, if you take godly wisdom and you apply it, you'll have pride and joy over its end result. But if you go ahead with your own, all you do is put more encumbrances on yourself if God's not in it. Now, I'm not saying don't trade your car until it's paid for. What I'm saying is, let God be the ruler yeah. of, your, of your decisions and, and your actions and, and your desires. And, and it'll work. It'll work on your behalf rather than against you. Galatians, I, I read you Galatians 5.26. I'll read it one more time quickly. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Often that is envy is accompanied by anger and cruelty. Proverbs 27, verse 4, A. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming. So I was looking at that, and in Greek it says having flared nostrils and angry expressions. Anybody ever see that before? All the time. 
<laughs> on television? Oh, okay, phew. I have to be more careful what I say up here. Another definition is fierce and being intensively aggressive. Do you know you don't have to yell to be intensively aggressive? Come here, Ad. Come here, Josh. Listen, I don't want you to feel unduly influenced by what I'm about to tell you. Okay. Look at me when I'm talking to you. But I, I don't like what you've been doing at all. I don't like it. It's wrong. God told me it's wrong for you. You know why he told me it's wrong for you? Because it's wrong for me. <laughs> so don't do it again. Yes, sir. Just know, we're buds. You're my, you're my, you're my oh, yeah. assistant yeah. guy. I'm happy for you and your wife. Oh, yeah. Just stay where I tell you to stay. Don't, don't get too pushy. <laughs> no, obviously that's an exaggeration. But, or there's the, of course I'm happy. We've all, do me a favor, don't picture somebody else. <laughs> picture yourself. <laughs> because then you're back up to the conceited part. Then in, in pr the second half of Proverbs 27, 4 says this. I'll read the first half with it. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand against jealousy? Who can stand against jealousy? There's a scripture that tells us when the enemy comes against us, what, a, what are we to do in, in Ephesians 6? Put on that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having overcome all, stand victorious. That's the literal translation. To withstand. And it says here, the Spirit of God said, who can stand or withstand jealousy? Anybody here ever been jealous? Of someone, something, some situation, some vacation? Oh, yeah, yeah we, we just, it's, it's been a rough year, so we're taking a light vacation. We're going to Honolulu for a month. I'm not jealous. I have to shovel tomorrow. I mean, you, you know. I mean, there are many faces. Jealousy is envious of someone else. This, this, is, this is cool. Envious of someone's achievements. We've seen that. Envious of someone's advantages. Born into the right family. Hooked up with the right friend, whatever that might be. Or envious of their situation. In other words, the things that are going on in their life. Another definition of jealous is suspicious of and or possessive. Any girls ever date a guy or guy date a girl or know of anybody in, in a marriage? Maybe they married your buddy or your, or your, or, or your, your girlfriend, ladies, where the spouse or the friend, well, even in an employment, because my mom went through this, even in an employment situation where the other person acted as though they were now your per, their personal property. And, you, and you're thinking, like, don't you see that? What's that? Don't you see that? I have some guys I used to lift with, you know, and they, 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 they went from being Mr. Macho to, yes, dear. Yes, dear. And I'm like, oh, come on. Wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah, we're going to get married. Are you nuts? You're not even you anymore. Well, they're not the new I was used to. But they seemed happy with it. But my mom worked at a, at, at a, at a company that dealt with abused children, homeless children, orphans, uh, abandoned she was the executive uh, secretary to the director, what, what you would call now executive assistant. Um, 
And with, without my mom, and this is no judging, this guy, all of his details f fell apart. And so he decided, he started making a friendship with my dad, and then they started, he started inviting him up, had a nice property down by the coast, and they would always invite us. Every so often we would go, and we'd barbecue, and we'd sit, we'd, we'd have fun, we'd enjoy uh, we'd enjoy the, the company. They, they own blueberry fields as, uh, as a hobby. And uh, I mean, we just, and then the next thing you know, we were going like every couple of weeks. And then it was like every weekend. And this went on for a few years. And then all of a sudden, one day, my mom just up, gave her resignation and quit. I never could figure that out because they've been seemingly so close. And then that's it. And I thought, geez. And I would ask them, and they would say, well, it was just time. I didn't want to work anymore. So my mom became a stay-at-home mom. It wasn't until years later, and I got talking with my father. So, well, what's up with that? I mean, it went from best, it must be absolutely the best, closest friends, family. I, their kids were in high school with me and stuff like that. And to... I mean, anything they had was mine, anything, you know, like that, they would just, you know, some people like that, to, boom, they're not part of our life anymore. And so my dad told me that my mom's boss, he had such sense of inadequacy in himself and became so dependent on what my wife did, my wife, my mom did for him at work to give him confidence to do what he was well able to do on his own, but over time had lost confidence in himself. The man was once a minister of the gospel and quit because of feelings of inadequacy. And then went into the, well-educated, went into this career and had made a career for himself in this field, but he, he became a heavier drinker over time. Because that was, he was, that was his substitute courage. And it got to the point that if my mom and dad decided to take a vacation somewhere, and it was different than the plans he wanted us all to have, he'd go into a rage. Yeah. I never knew. Uh, and uh, this started happening more and more. And so they tried distancing and distancing. And then finally it was like... And I'm going to be honest with you. I, that man, uh, when he was being himself, you would never find a nicer person in the whole world. I mean, he had qualities. He had ability. The guy was brilliant. He was brilliant. But because he had no self-image. Now, this guy was a minister of the gospel. He had a born-again experience but he lost his trust in God's ability to take care of his needs and began to cling to other people in order to do it. And unfortunately, it ended up hitting our family. And he became jealous of their time, my mom and dad's time, and their plans for themselves. So I got to, I've seen an extreme in my life. Hopefully... You don't know anybody who's, been, who's there or going there, but just realize, if you allow a spirit of competition to step in, these are some of the things that they're going to be bringing. Pride, conceit, envy, jealous, possessiveness, suspicion, combativeness and challenging, anger, superiority. You say, what do you mean superiority? Well, when you think you're what somebody else needs what somebody else should do is wrong if it clashes with what you think it should be, then you're saying your thoughts are superior to their thoughts. But let's take it to the, let's take it to the level it belongs to. Because we're not trusting and relying on God, we're putting ourselves in a position of superiority over God himself, over the Holy Spirit. Some people don't go to churches uh, for very long because they don't honor my gift. We've seen it. We've had people come and go. Uh, they don't honor my gift. 
So I'm going to go somewhere. Somebody's going to honor your gift. Well, did you stay there long enough to show them uh, some humility and, and that, that you were there to contribute to their vision and not them, you weren't there to have them recognize yours? And very seldom did that ever happen. Most of the time, it was that situation. I had a guy, when we were at the building on Appleton Street, after a service one day, we'd had a visitor. Uh, I'd seen him before at, char- at some of the charismatic group meetings that we'd had in, in the community uh, that the pastors would do together. Uh, and he was visiting, and I talked with him for a little bit. Didn't know who he was, but I had seen him at these. And I, I welcomed him, and he said, I said, uh, oh, is he just visiting? He said, well, no. He said, I'm looking for another church. I said, oh. I said, uh, and I'm thinking, why are you looking for another church? Did, you, you know, did something happen? And he was pretty vague and, and so forth. Uh, but basically it was, th- they, things weren't going at the church the way he thought they ought to go. Conceit, envy. Then I thought, hmm, well, what would you think of the church? Said, it, was, it was good. He said, but I got a question for you. Oh, I said, oh, okay, what's that? How do you get on the board in this church? <laughs> First question. How do you get on the board in this church? And I said, Ooh, I think I see this envious of position. I got to look right there. And I said, You don't. I said, I have a board of directors that are made up of ministers who are not part of this church but who have already gone where we're trying to go, and financial people who have a lot more expertise in financial things than I do. He said, well, don't, doesn't your congregation have any say in this? I said, yeah, every time the offering bucket goes around, they give me their opinion. <laughs> Come on, let's be, let's be honest. And uh, so he got mad. We never saw him again. And... Uh, much to, much to my great relief, none of, I, 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 every month I sit with some of the other pastors, mostly evangelical now, because uh, a, you know, a lot of the Pentecostals have gone evangelical too, but uh, he has never shown up in any of their churches, so I'm very thankful for the prayers for my friends. <laughs> but let's, let's finish this off with what we need to be looking at, though. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3 tells us God's mind on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Oh my goodness, okay. Heading towards 1130, I want to get us done. This is how God sees these characteristics that, that have been perverted by a spirit of competition. For you're still in the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh, and behaving, let's look at this, only in a human way. That's right. English Standard Version. O- behaving only in a human way. Now think about that. God's, we are human, aren't we? Yes. But the Bible says that we've been changed into the image of Christ. We've been adopted into his family. We are royalty by adoption. We're brothers and sisters of Christ by adoption. We're redeemed and not eternally damned because of the blood. And our purpose is not only to develop ourselves into the image and character of Christ, but to walk in his steps. When Jesus says you're only human, he's saying your characteristics have demoted your influence from supernatural to fleshly. You are now only influencing those around you by the flesh and not by the spirit. That's pretty intense. But there is a solution. Hallelujah. So as you look at that and it says, God's basically said you're living like... So I I looked that up, and and what he said was, in a human way, another translation says, you're living as though you were still carnal and unregenerated by the blood. You are under the control... Another one says, you're under the control 
of your emotions and desires. The next one says you're lacking the qualities of the love walk. Geez, God, I might have put this thing away a month ago. I, I, I like preaching upbeat stuff, but we're getting there. But this is intense. Lacking the qualities of the love walk, which is the fundamental quality of a born-again spirit. And it's described in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant, nor is it rude. It does not insist on its own way, but prefers the ways of others. It is not irritable or resentful. And you think, my gosh, if God looks at me and says, you, you look like and act like an unsaved person. I have to admit, based on what I've been preaching so far today, I have acted like an unsaved person on more than one occasion more often than I would care to admit. Even since I've been a minister of the gospel and on occasion standing in this pulpit. We war not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Therefore, take unto yourself the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having overcome all, stand therefore, having your, the helmet of, of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, girding your loins about with the truth of the word, having your feet shod with the preparation or the delivery of the gospel you need saved, holding the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the enemies and the sword of the Spirit, which allows you to sever any situation to discern the difference between flesh and spirit. That's how we're supposed to be walking 24-7. That's what our character produces. So I have to admit, there are times, even coming into a pulpit, I've left my armor home. Anybody here ever come to church and left your armor home? Don't raise your hands, please. So what do we do? God's advice is so simple I love him. He's always so direct, so simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it in order to receive a perishable wreath. But we train that we might obtain an imperishable crown. So do not run aimlessly. I myself don't box as though I'm fighting the air. But I lest after preaching to other people about the good way of God myself should become disqualified. Paul was concerned about being disqualified from the gospel of grace. The guy who wrote grace. I say the guy who wrote grace, that's kind of like saying Dad Hagen invented faith. He picked it up, for, guess who he got it from? God and the Old Covenant. So the only road for you and I to win in life and in the kingdom is to exercise self-control in all things and make our goal to re receive the imperishable crown, not accolades here. How do you do that? How do we do that? Well, Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since you and I are surrounded by such a great cloud 
of witnesses in the heavenlies. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us. And now we get back to Corinthians. And run with endurance the race that's set before you. What I love about this, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Why did he say that? Let us lay aside the weight. Because you become part of the great cloud of witnesses by depart, for you and I by departing this life. And then now we're in the heavenlies with Christ. Amen? Are there any more weights of sin when you're in heaven? Is there any more having to stand in victory over the, over the elements of the, of the world, the flesh and the devil? No, you're liberated and you're cleansed. And, you, and we look at that and say, yeah, but I don't want to go to get there. But guess what? God says that he's no respecter of persons, right? Enoch didn't have to die to dwell in that heavenly place. It says he just walked with God daily, and one, God, one day God said, hey, come see my house. Come see my house. We have the capability, although it seems that few reach it, of walking a resurrected life as fully as someone who is living with the cloud of witnesses now. The difference being they no longer have to stand and wear their armor. We do. But God likens it to us. And he said, because of this, lay aside every weight and the sin, meaning you can. And run this race with endurance. So set aside those characteristics that are ungodly, that are hurtful, that are damaging. Because yes. they're not just damaging inward, they're damaging outward. Yes. Some husbands and wives spend years trying to rectify the damage done by the spirit of competition. Set it aside. Come together. Set it aside. Prefer one another, over, one over the other. You know, it's an interesting marriage when both parts of that marriage fight to see who's going to give up their preference to bless the other. One of the downsides is, is you may never end up going out to a restaurant again. But on the other hand, you're going to have a much happier life. And then the last thing. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. Success and promotion with joy. That's what the Spirit of the Lord told me when I finished this. Success and promotion with joy only comes when the Lord is the motivation behind your promotion. The Lord is love and service, not position, possession, or status. So if you struggle with these characteristics, don't ignore them until you end up having a demonic spirit occupying your flesh. You say, oh, pastor, can a Christian have a demon? Yes. A Christian can have everything that they want. Yes. Can they be possessed? No. no. Your spirit can't be possessed. You're born again. But... Because possession is, un, is an unwilling thing. But you can allow a spirit into your flesh by succumbing to the decisions of the mind, the will, and the emotions, and your fleshly drawings. Most of the time, Lester Hagen said this, there, there are seven steps to demonic possession. For a believer, there's only six steps that we deal with. He said in the first five, you don't even need anybody to pray over you. You just need to decide to repent and to ask the guidance of the Holy Spirit and command the Spirit to leave. Beyond that, if it's something that you cannot seem to control, you may need prayer 
to be delivered of a spirit that's possessing your body. Just like, he, like a spirit often does with sickness in your flesh. How often I'd listen to Dad Hagen in, in prayer lines, commanding spirits to leave people's bodies, commanding spirits to leave people's minds, mind-binding spirits. Amen. And he said, and, and, and Dad said many times he, would, he, he was given the ability to have discerning of spirits. The, the literal translation uh, of discerning of spirits means you actually see into the supernatural realm. You see angels and devils or angels or devils. It's not, I discern you get a spirit. That's not the discerning of spirits. Sorry. That's not what it is. And he would see that. He said, they often, he said, his statement to us was, he said, did you ever see that little character uh, in, in that movie about the kid and the, the man from out of space? Uh, E.T. He says, that's what they look like. He says, that's what those demons look like. like look, he says, some of them look like monkeys. Yeah. And they, he'd see them sometimes with their hands around somebody's head or the heart in the hand of a person, yeah. the arm right in their chest, yeah. holding on to their heart. And he would, God would show them, like, I'm looking at you or you're looking at me. And when he would command them in Jesus' name, when this person truly wanted to be liberated, they had to go. When he come, they'd fall off and they'd hit the road. But the way we stay liberated, if you're not, if you're not say, well, how do I know if I've got a devil? Do what the word says first and you probably won't need prayer. Amen? Amen? Walk in love, walk in mercy, prefer others above you. Don't think that what you want in life is the most important thing to everyone you know. What's most important is his father. Since my life is not my own, what's the most important thing that you want in my life? If you go there, you're not going to have time to worry about anybody else. That's right. Trust me. That's right. But it's a journey you'll enjoy Uncomfortable? Yes. Yeah. Because what you immediately find out is you're wearing a pair of shoes that's at least a size too small and that's where your pain is coming from. You chose what you wanted, but God's got a different pair of shoes for you to walk out your walk. And it's a lot more comfortable even when he takes you into some muddy places. You'll always be properly equipped. Just read Ephesians. Amen?